In this video, we're going to talk about Lagrange's theorem, which is one of the most useful basic theorems in group theory. First, let's look at the statement of Lagrange's theorem, which is very simple. It just says that if G is any finite group, and if H is any subgroup of G, then the order of H must divide the order of G. Now, because this is such a fundamental result, I think we should lay a good foundation by looking carefully at the proof. We'll prove this theorem in two steps. In the first step, we'll define an equivalence relation on the group G, which, remember, gives rise to a partition of G into equivalence classes. And in the second step, we'll show that each of the equivalence classes has cardinality equal to the order of H. That will allow us to easily deduce that the order of H must be a divisor of the order of G. So for the first step, let's define a relation on G by the rule that two elements, little g and little g prime and g, are related if and only if there exists an H in H such that G is equal to G prime times H. Please keep in mind in what follows that we're not assuming that G is an abelian group, so we can't a priori interchange the orders of multiplications. So the rule here is that G is related to G prime if and only if there exists an H in the subgroup H with the property that G is equal to G prime times H. Now we claim that this relation is actually an equivalence relation on G. So remembering what we learned in the video about equivalence relations, we need to check three things. First of all, we need to check that the relation is reflexive. But if you think about it, since H was assumed to be a subgroup of G, and since any subgroup must contain the identity element, we have that for any G in G, G is equal to G times the identity element. And since the identity element is an element of H, that guarantees that every element of the group G is related to itself. Therefore, this relation is reflexive. Next, we want to show that this relation is symmetric. So let's assume that G and G prime are two elements of G with G related to G prime. Well then, by definition, that means that there exists an H and H such that G is equal to G prime H. Now remember that what I'm trying to show is that G prime is related to G. And so what I want to do here is multiply both sides of this equation on the right by the element H inverse. When I do that, I'm going to get that G prime is equal to G times H inverse. But again, since H is a group and H is in H, I also know that H inverse is in H. So by the definition, I now have that G prime is related to G. That establishes that this relation is also symmetric. Finally, to see why this relation is transitive, let's suppose that I have three elements G1, G2, and G3 in the group G, that G1 is related to G2 and that G2 is related to G3. By the definition of the relation, that means that there exists H1 and H2 in H, such that G1 is G2 times H1 and G2 is G3 times H2. Well now, if I just take the first equation here and I substitute in G3H2 for G2, then by associativity I can move the parentheses over, and since H is a subgroup of G, I know that it's closed under multiplication, so H2H1 is an element of H, which allows us to conclude that G1 is related to G3. That establishes that this relation is also transitive. Finally, since it's reflexive, symmetric, and transitive, that means that this relation is an equivalence relation on G. For the second step of the proof, let's let A1 to AK be the distinct equivalence classes for this equivalence relation. From our video on equivalence relations, we know that the equivalence classes of an equivalence relation on a set partition the set, so that they're pairwise disjoint and their union is the whole set. Now because G is a finite group, that means that the cardinality of G is the sum of the cardinalities of each of the equivalence classes. And what I'd like to now show is that all of these equivalence classes in fact have the same cardinality, which is equal to the cardinality of the subgroup H. So in order to do that, choose your favorite equivalence class AI and choose an element G in AI. And then define a map tau from H to AI by the rule that tau of any element of H is equal to G times H. Notice that anything in the image of this map is going to be related to G by the definition of the relation. And so it's going to be an element of the same equivalence class as G. Therefore, this is a well-defined map from H to the equivalence class AI. Now what we claim is that this map is actually a bijection. And in order to show that, first let's show that it's surjective. To show that this map is surjective, we need to show that every element of the codomain is the image under tau of some point in the domain. So suppose that G prime is an element of the equivalence class AI. Well then, by definition, that means that G prime is related to G. And by the definition of the relation, that means that there exists an element H in the subgroup H 
with the property that g prime is equal to g times h. Well, g times h is precisely what we define to be tau of h. So that demonstrates that every element of the equivalence class AI is the image of a point in the domain. Therefore, the map is surjective. Next, let's look at the proof of injectivity, which is really very easy. What we want to show is that if h and h prime get sent by tau to the same point in AI, then they had to actually be the same point in the domain to begin with. So suppose that h and h prime are elements of h, and that tau of h is equal to tau of h prime. By the definition of tau, that just means that g times h is equal to g times h prime. But now, because of the cancellation law in the group h, I can see that h has to be equal to h prime, which shows that this map is injective. Since the map tau is both surjective and injective, I know that it's a bijection, which allows me to conclude that the cardinality of h is equal to the cardinality of ai. Notice also that the role of i in this argument is completely arbitrary, so the same argument shows that all of the equivalence classes have the same cardinality, which is the cardinality of h. Now if I just plug this into my formula at the top for the order of g, I have that the order of g is equal to k times the order of h. But both of the quantities on the right-hand side here are integers, so that allows me right away to conclude that the order of h must divide the order of g. That concludes the proof of Lagrange's theorem. I'd like to wrap this video up by showing you a few consequences of Lagrange's theorem, and then giving you a simple example of how it can be useful in practice. So the first important consequence that I want to mention is that if g is any finite group, and little g is any element of g, then the order of the element little g must divide the order of the group g. Now remember from our previous video that the order of an element little g is the smallest natural number k with the property that g to the k is the identity, or infinity if such a k doesn't exist. Because we're working in a finite group though, it's not difficult to see that every element is going to have finite order. So what this theorem says is that if you take the smallest positive integer with the property that g to the k is the identity, then that integer must divide the cardinality of g. Well, the proof of this is pretty easy now that we have Lagrange's theorem, and the key is just to observe, as we proved in the previous video, that the order of an element of a group is equal to the order of the cyclic subgroup that it generates. Since the cyclic subgroup generated by the element little g is a subgroup of the group g, by Lagrange's theorem we conclude that it must divide the order of the group g. That completes the proof of this theorem. A simple corollary of this theorem is that if g is any finite group, and if little g is any element of g, then when you take the element little g, and you raise it to the power of the order of the group g, you always get the identity element. This is something that I mentioned a couple of videos ago when we were talking about the integers modulo n, and now we can prove it pretty easily. By the theorem we know that if capital G is any finite group, then the order of any element must divide the order of the group. Writing out what that means, there must be a positive integer k with the property that the order of the group is k times the order of the element. But then when I take g to the power of the order of the group, by properties of exponents I get g to the power of the order of g to the k. But now remembering the definition of the order of g, it's the smallest integer with the property that when I raise g to that power I get the identity. So that means that the expression in the parentheses here is really just the identity element, and that completes the proof. Well now we can go back and patch another hole by giving a really easy proof of Euler's theorem from our video Important Facts About Integers Modulo N. Remember, Euler's theorem was the one that said if n is any natural number, and if a is any integer which is relatively prime to n, then when I take a and I raise it to the phi of n power, I always get 1 modulo n. To see how Euler's theorem follows immediately from the corollary that we just proved, consider the multiplicative group of primitive residue classes modulo n. The order of this group is phi of n, and the condition in the statement of Euler's theorem that the GCD of a and n is equal to 1 guarantees that the residue class a is an element of this group. Therefore, by the corollary, when I take that element and I raise it to the order of the group, I get the identity in the group. And in this setting, that's just saying that a to the phi of n is 1 modulo n. That gives us a very easy proof of Euler's theorem. Now let's look at an example. In the video where we talked about primitive roots, we mentioned without proof in one of the examples that 5 is a primitive root modulo 103. Well, now that we have Lagrange's theorem and all of its consequences, let's return to this problem and show that 5 is a primitive root modulo 103. Remember that to say that 5 is a primitive root modulo 103 means that 5 is a generator for the group z mod 103 z times. And since 103 is prime, the order of that group is 102. 
So what we need to show is that the order of five in this multiplicative group is 102. Well, we know from the theorem that we just saw that the order of five must be a divisor of the order of the group. So let's start by listing out all of the possibilities. In order to list out the divisors of 102, first we factor 102 as two times three times 17. And then we observe that because of the fundamental theorem of arithmetic, every divisor of this number must have the form two to the a times three to the b times 17 to the c where a, b, and c are non-negative integers that are all at most one. That means that there are two possibilities for each of a, b, and c, so the total number of choices for divisors of 102 is eight. Now, if we just go through all eight possible choices of a, b, c, then we find the eight divisors of 102, and I've listed them here in increasing order. Remember that we already know that five to the power 102 is one modulo 103 because of Euler's theorem, or even Fermat's theorem, so all we want to show is that when we raise 5 to any of these other powers, we don't get 1 modulo 103. Since the order of 5 has to be one of these numbers, that'll force it to be 102, and that'll mean that it's a generator for the group. So now let's go through the computation. 5 to the first power is 5 modulo 103, which is not 1. 5 squared is 25, 5 cubed is 22 modulo 103, and 5 to the sixth power is 5 cubed squared, which is 22 squared, which is 72 modulo 103. Notice that whenever you have a divisor, which is a multiple of a divisor that you've already seen, it means that you can use the answer from one of your previous computations to simplify the one that you're working on. Well, next we need to compute 5 to the 17th power modulo 103, and probably a quick way to do this one by hand is to use the square and multiply algorithm. So first of all, I write 17 as a sum of powers of two, and it's 16 plus one. So that means by properties of exponentials that five to the 17th is five to the 16th times five to the first. And then I break out a little scratch work and I successively compute five to the first power, five squared, five to the fourth, five to the eighth, and then five to the 16th modulo 103, each time just squaring the answer from the previous calculation. Now that I know all these values of five to powers of two, I can take the five to the 16th and the five to the first, and substitute them in here to find that five to the 17th is 57 modulo 103. Now the rest of the calculations are pretty easy because 34 is two times 17. So five to the 34th is five to the 17th squared, which is 57 squared, which is 56 modulo 103. And five to the 51st can either be written as five to the 17th cubed or five to the 34th times five to the 17th, which turns out to be negative one modulo 103. So at this point we can stop if you want, because we know that the multiplicative order of 5 modulo 103 is not any of the proper divisors of 102, so it has to be 102. But of course you can also see that directly if you just square the answer from the previous calculation. 5 to the 102 is 1, and 102 is the smallest divisor of 102 with this property. Therefore 5 is a primitive root modulo 103. As you can see this greatly reduces the number of things that you have to check when you're looking for a primitive root. Before we had Lagrange's theorem, we would have had to go through and check all of the powers of five up to 102. But now that we have Lagrange's theorem, we know that the order of five has to be a divisor of 102, so we can finish the problem after only seven pretty easy calculations. Okay, well, that's the end of this video. Now we're getting into some more pretty interesting stuff. And in the next video, we're going to talk more about cyclic groups.